Right. Um, can I uh, welcome you all to the uh, Southwest Learning and Skills Conference? Uh, this is the uh, uh, second conference that we have held here, and it's nice to see so, so many of you uh, in attendance. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Austin. Um, I, I chair the group, I'm head of service for Gloucestershire Adult Education. Uh, and it's my great pleasure so, to welcome you all and also to welcome the, uh, the speakers that we've got and participants for, for today. Before I uh, get into the um, introduction to the, the theme for, for today, uh, there is all the usual domestics just, just to run through. Uh, if you've not been here before, just so that you know you're around, there are toilet facilities uh, just off the lobby at the back of the room. There are also some additional toilet facilities, should we need queues, in the adjoining room just as you go out of this building. Uh, I've been asked that if you have um, put on your form that you've got special dietary needs, uh, to make yourself known at the coffee break to any of the people wandering around in the black and white uniforms. Okay, members, of, members of staff, they, they will be able to sort out, but they just need to make sure that they've got your details. Uh, can you check your phones, please? Just make sure that we are all switched off or vibrating or whatever. Uh, I've not been informed that there is a fire alarm practice uh, for today, so I assume that if anything starts ringing that we remove ourselves from the building. Um, the, what we will uh, be having this afternoon are a series of workshop sessions, as you know, hopefully you have signed up uh, for them, hopefully you will remember which room it is that you are going to be going to. If you're not, uh, we'll bring the uh, signing in sheets and we'll, we'll post them on the, uh, the glass wall at the back so that you can check later on. The rooms that we're, we are using will have, for the first session, there will actually be two groups in this room. Uh, the other two rooms that we've got, two breakout rooms, you go out through the archway, turn right and turn right again. And one is the, the butler room, which uh, you will see was a butlin room. Butlin. Butlin. Butlin room, which you'll see as you, you go down towards the big impressive building at the bottom called the Hyde. The second breakout room is actually in the Hyde itself, and it's Studio One. One, the first Studio one. Studio One. Okay. But we'll sort out uh, just before lunchtime. I'll run through that again so that you know where to go after lunch. Okay, so um, I think that's about it on, on the practical aspects. Um, we um, have today, as you know, this theme that is looking at the connections between adult learning and health. And can I say I'm particularly grateful to uh, Penny Lamb, who's, who's going to be talking also this morning, but in terms of making suggestions for our speakers and uh, some of the workshop sessions that will be going on today. And we've got a range of, of speakers this morning, at the end of which there will be an opportunity for you to talk about what you've heard in your groups, and at the end of the morning for you to come back with, hopefully, a whole series of questions for the panel of speakers. So we'll, we'll kick off and this should be exciting because this is the first time that we've used technology for um, our um, presentations. Our first speaker uh, is Tarani Chandler who is uh, currently sitting in Manchester and hopefully is on the other end of the Skype connection. Um, um, yes, I'm here too. Yes. Excellent. Well, I'm here. Yes. Okay, great. Excellent. Uh, Tarani is, is Professor of Medical Sociology at Manchester University and we'll be talking about the scope for adult learning to help reduce health inequalities. And it's part of a report and you all have copies of the report, the full report, and this is uh, one aspect 
of that report that Tavani uh, is going to talk about. Um, with that, I'll hand over to Manchester. Thank you very much, Jim, and thank you for the invitation to uh, speak today at this very interesting conference. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but because I've got uh, a few meetings um, booked in for later this afternoon at, at the university. But uh, I, I was looking through the presentations, and they, they all look really interesting, and I could learn a lot by attending this conference. Um, I've got about 13, 13 slides or so, so um, every time I, I, I go to the next slide, I'll, I'll try to remember to inform you that I'm going to the next slide. This work that I'm talking about today was done in conjunction with uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Andrew Jenkins, who's at the Institute of Education. And I'm um, going to the second slide now, which is the slide of the cover of the uh, British Academy report on nine local actions to reduce health inequalities. Andrew and myself uh, wrote a chapter on this, uh, for this report um, on the role of adult and further education, um, and that is basically the, 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 sum, the summary of this report I'll be talking about today. Um, the evidence for uh, this, this chapter also came from an ESRC grant that uh, I, I, I was um, funded by to look at the role of adult education on, on health inequalities. So I'm going on to uh, my third slide that entitled Poor Groups Suffer Disproportionately from Regressive Taxation and Pricing Regimes. Uh, this is a quote that's direct from the Monarch Review on Health Inequalities. Um, and in it, um, in the slide shows um, an example of how you can have very good public health measures, but that doesn't necessarily translate as uh, good measures to reduce health inequalities, you can actually increase health inequalities by having good public health measures. So just because you have a very good public health intervention, that doesn't necessarily decrease inequalities in health, it can, it can actually increase inequalities in health. So the example on this slide is on tobacco control policies. And on the left-hand side of the graph, you have uh, an evaluation of the effect of to tobacco control policies on reducing um, inequalities um, in, uh, in income, occupation, and education, uh, social inequalities, uh, and, and the effects of uh, restricting tobacco control in, in the workplaces, in effect, banning smoking in, in the workplace, um, actually had no change on the on on a lot of the policies had no change on the gradient and actually had a, a positive change on the gradient. In effect, it increased the income, occupational and educational inequalities. So here you have a very good intervention, that is a good public health intervention in terms of banning smoking in, in the workplace, but actually the people who have benefited aren't the lower income groups or the lower occupational and educational groups, but it's actually the, the higher income and occupational and educational groups. For uh, something like pricing, you've got evidence both for uh, a, a, an increase in health inequalities as well as a decrease in health inequalities. So a, a mixed bag of evidence. Uh, but I just wanted to include that slide as an example of how good public health policies can be to um, actually no effect on health inequalities or actually increases. My fourth slide has a picture of David Burns. Um, that's the university's minister who, about a year ago, was saying how people should engage in more um, in adult education. Um, older adults should engage in more adult education because it makes them more employable, gives them better skills, and helps them to remain in the job market. Um, however, this is an approach to adult education. Um, that is not entirely borne out uh, by the evidence. So I'm turning to my fifth slide now, which is uh, uh, entitled The Effects of Adult Learning Courses on the Probability of Giving Up Smoking, Increasing Exercise, and Reducing the Onset of Depression. So this is taken from the uh, wider group on the benefits of learning, based at the Institute of Education, uh, that was led by uh, Leo Feinstein. Um, and they produced this report that examined well, what was the benefits, the health benefits of engaging in adult learning. And um, although 
there seems to be positive health benefits in terms of you see that there, there is an increased probability of giving up smoking, increased exercise, and reduced onset of depression for uh, academic, vocational, and leisure adult learning. Um, actually, in terms of significant effects, you only see that for uh, the leisure type of publications. Those p values are, are only significant on the right hand side of the graph for uh, leisure publications. So, uh, participating in adult learning leading to academic or vocational publications didn't seem to have much of a health benefit in this particular study, but it was particularly those adults who engaged in leisure type qualifications uh, that seemed to be benefiting from better health uh, and health behaviors. Um, however, one of the uh, limitations of this study is that it didn't explicitly look at health inequalities. So my particular question was about, well, okay, there didn't seem to be much of a health benefit uh, for those people engaged in academic qualifications. But what if you looked at the subset of people who left school without any qualifications, uh, but went back to went back to full-time education or part-time education and obtained some academic or vocational qualifications? So I wasn't particularly interested in looking at the health benefits um, for the whole population, but just the subpopulation, the disadvantaged or deprived groups. Uh, you know, poor, uh, such as the disadvantaged social classes, but particularly those groups who left school without any qualifications. Um, for this subset, uh, would we see any particular health benefits? So I investigated uh, the National Child Development Study, so I'm now on slide 6, which shows the, uh, the different sweeps and longitudinal uh, dates of this uh, cohort of children who were born in 1958. Um, and they were born in 1958 and they were measured uh, repeatedly as they grew up at ages 7, 11, 16, 23, 33, 42. Uh, and this went on to examine whether they're age 15, 50 plus. So you can see that there were originally about seven, over 17,000 children in the sample. And uh, even by the age of uh, 42, there remained quite, quite a few of these um, Adults uh, now who are now mature, um, and over 15,000 of these adults remained in the sample. Um, so I'm now on slide seven, which shows the unemployment rates in the 1980s and the rates of adult learning for these children from the uh, 1958 birth cohort, the, the NCDS. And it shows uh, two lines there. The, uh, the green line is the proportion of these um, uh, adults who were aged between 23 and 33 in the 80s, uh, in the early 80s and early 90s. Uh, the proportion of, them, of the, those uh, NCDS uh, adults uh, who had left school without any qualifications but returned to some form of adult learning to obtain qualifications uh, in midlife between the ages of 23 and 33. Um, and you see that there's a really strong correlation uh, with the uh, unemployment rates during the 1980s. So when the unemployment rates were, uh, were, were, uh, were, 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 were coming down, the, in the late 80s, um, the, the, the rates of adult education, um, engagement in adult education uh, were, were increasing. In slide 8, uh, so this is the slide entitled Higher Qualification Effects on the CHD Risk Score for Men. Um, I looked at this group of, of people who went back to um, adult education in, in midlife um, and looked at the associations with coronary heart disease risk, standard, standard measures of uh, CHD coronary heart disease risk, stratified by the initial level of qualifications for uh, this group of people left full-time education. Um, and among uh, male adults, among men, who left school without any qualifications at age 16. So I'm looking at the two left-hand bars on the extreme left-hand side, uh, the blue bars and the red bars. So the blue bar are the group of men who left school uh, without any qualifications at the age of 16. And the red bar is a subset of this group 
who also left school without any qualifications but returned to uh, in midlife to obtain some higher qualifications, usually at levels one or two, uh, not to a degree level. Most of them obtained levels one or two qualifications in midlife. And we see quite a marked decrease in the risk of coronary heart disease amongst uh, this group of men who left school without any qualifications but went back at mid in midlife to obtain some level one or two qualifications in the red part. For the uh, other groups of men uh, of O level and A level equivalent groups, so there wasn't much of a benefit, there, there wasn't much apparent benefit of returning to um, education in midlife to obtain a higher level of qualifications. It was, this, this effect was only seen amongst the men who left school without any qualifications. And on the next slide, which is the same slide, I'm looking at women, um, there, there was a slightly different story uh, in that there, there was a benefit of returning to education uh, for every level of initial qualification. The benefit of returning to education was apparent for women who left school without any qualifications, who left school with O-level equivalent qualifications, and who left school with A-level equivalent qualifications. The next slide, which is entitled this by Tenma, the percentage of the National Child Development Study Respondents from age 2350 who report poor suffering and health. Um, so in this slide, I examined the trajectories of poor suffering health across midlife for these different groups of adult learners compared to those who didn't engage in any adult learning qualifications after the first even full-time education. So it's the top two blue lines that are of particular interest. The top blue line is the group of adults, uh, of adults who uh, left school without any qualifications uh, and their rates of poor self-related health dramatically increase um, as they get older. Um, but for the corresponding group of adults who also left school without any qualifications but went on sometime later on in life to obtain some qualifications, uh, as I said, mostly at levels one or two, uh, their, their rates of poor self rated health also increases, but not as steeply, not as dramatically. Uh, and then for the groups in green, which are comparing the older level equivalent uh, qualifications, there didn't seem to be much benefit. Uh, at least in terms of poor self rated health, in terms of returns to education later on in life. Uh, my next slide, uh, which is entitled Basic Literacy and Numeracy Courses, the next, these next few slides are basically examining some of the mechanisms for, um, by which um, adult uh, education courses can result in uh, better health. But I, I noticed from um, my other colleagues who are speaking today, uh, that this is really the, the substance of their work. So uh, I, I really don't want to go into much detail on it because it will be covered much better uh, by, by the late the pre pre presenters. Just to highlight, for example, um, Ofsted's uh, report in 2012 about how many uh, job seekers have basic literacy and numeracy uh, gaps um, and, and, and these type of level ones and level two courses um, are often targeted at these uh, basic numeracy and literacy skills. So, and we know very well that uh, the lack of a job can have very um, uh, damaging experiences for someone's health. The next slide is about uh, the role of health literacy. Uh, but I also notice that it's, it's being covered very well by uh, Janet and Penny's presentation. So. Uh, I won't go much into, uh, I won't go into any detail about the role of health literacy over here. So, um, my next slide, which is uh, my, my last two final slides, which is about the, the second last one, is can we infer from that of education program outcomes among other vulnerable groups? I just wanted to test, to, to, to look at the role of adult, adult education in another context, not just the general population but the uh, prison population. And this is because in this uh, particular group, we do see quite strong effects of adult learning, adult education programs um, in terms of recidivism outcomes that appears to be a clear benefit. Now I know that recidivism is a uh, health outcome, 
but it's, 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 a, it's perhaps a good proxy for a positive social outcome uh, that's particularly important in this, this population. And the, the reason why I chose this, this group to, to, to look at is because I thought um, that, that the kinds of studies that, they, that have been conducted here, there have been a few experimental and quasi-experimental studies here uh, that actually show the benefits of adult learning. And uh, my final slide just reminds us, in an attempt to remind myself and, and the audience that there are problems with um, the analysis that I've shown. There are key problems with selection issues um, in terms of the analysis. The adults who engage in adult learning may be different from those who don't engage in adult learning, especially in terms of their psychological or resilience characteristics. So it's, it's hard to estimate the causal effects of adult learning on, on health. Uh, you often hear it's not easy to return to adult education, especially if you have poor learning experiences at school. So the people who actually do manage to return to adult education overcome significant psychological, financial and social barriers. And this makes them quite special and different from the group who don't return. So it's, it's quite hard, as I said, to, to estimate these kinds of causal effects on, um, of adult education on, um, on health later on in life. On the other hand, um, we do know that uh, basic literacy and numeracy skills are key to social participation and um, health benefits later on in life. Um, we also know that intervening in uh, such basic literacy and numeracy programs at levels one and two is going to be progressive. The only people who would benefit from this are people who are disadvantaged to, to start with. Um, and so it's not going to be a regressive policy like many good public health uh, interventions, which are good in general for the population, but it's, it's regressive in terms of health inequalities. It actually promotes increasing health inequalities. And my, my very last words are about uh, it's not too late. Uh, so very often we hear in adult education that it's too late. You know, people have the perception that it's too late to return to adult education later on in life. And, uh, and, and I work in public health and epidemiology where there, there's a very strong focus on childhood interventions. Uh, and it's very often people say it's too late by the time they become adults. And, uh, I just wanted to show that actually there, there can be good public health interventions that are good in terms, also good in terms of um, health inequalities, and it's not too late to intervene by the time people are uh, in their midlife or later on in life. Thank you. And the, the, the project and the learning that goes on, that there is uh, a beneficial effect. We've not necessarily always had evidence to be able to support that. And I will mean, take the, the, the caveats that uh, you've referred to, but nevertheless, to have this sort of evidence starting to appear that is not just current but is longitudinal, I think helps us going forward in any discussions with colleagues in the in the health sector. So can I on behalf of everybody thank you very much for your presentation and we'll we'll come back to you a bit later on this morning. Sure. Hopefully we'll have a series of questions. Okay. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, right, we'll move on now to our, our next speaker who's Janet Solo who is the director of Community Health uh, and Learning Foundation. Um, the Foundation works in the areas of health literacy, addressing health inequalities through learning. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. Can I just stand here so I can have the things that go along? Yeah. Um, but, so I'm not turning around, I'm going to be um, the areas I'm going to cover today is, what I want to look at today is the, the opportunities that are now going to hopefully arise with the movement of um, some of the public health functions from the NHS into the local authority and how you may be able to develop those partnerships to um, look at 
education and health. Um, on the caveat that it's not just the one way street, it's not just you know, engaging with them, but <coughs> engaging with education as well. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about public health and health inequalities and the impact that that has on people um, with low levels of um, skills and knowledge. Um, then I'm going to talk about the impact that education have on, can have on addressing those health inequalities that we've just been talking about. And then um, the, pri the key priorities for education and for health and how those synergies, and look at the synergies about where um, education can support health and health can help education. And then some steps that can be taken to, to hopefully form those partnerships. So that's how I do today. So, um, public health really, the emphasis of public health is not about um, treatment of ill health, but it's about preventing it. And it's looking at those social determinants of health that impact on people's lifestyles and looking at ways of improving those determinants. Um, there are quite a lot of factors that affect people's health and determine people's health. Um, where they live, their education, their health behaviours, their income, and the environment in which they're living in. And it's those factors, um, and it's quite often those people that have the lowest levels of skills that um, have the worst health outcomes, um, are unemployed, have low incomes, live in poor housing, and that all impacts on their health, um, and impacts on their ability to lead a healthy lifestyle. Um, and we you know now that, and we've talked about the uh, widening gap of um, inequality um, between those people that have more skills than those people that don't. And that, in fact, it's um, increasing all the time. I think while I've been involved in health literacy for the last 13 years, that gap's widened even more. So although we've improved everybody's health, those people on low incomes with no education um, have... Have, are more likely to live longer with more diseases and die earlier of preventable deaths than people that have better education and more income. So, um, yeah, so the gap's widening, um, and I think that was something that was just said before that you know it seems to be increasing. So, even though there's some good public health interventions, it's not impacting on those people that need it most, and that's the area where I think adult education can play a role. In addressing those health inequalities. Um, Marmot said in his um, work that, he, that it's, people can't control the things that affect their lifestyle, and it's more the role of government and um, public health. Um, and I, you know, to some extent, I, I agree with that. And I think again, that was ratified in what was just being said. Um, the impact on the ground is that those people, when this is the um, Centre for the Wider Studies of um, the Benefits of Learning. And I have heard people who, who had GCSEs and those people that had them to the age of 33. And those people that had no GCSEs were more likely to smoke more, more likely to drink more, take less exercise, um, suffer um, from depression more, have more back pain, and that, um, had So there's been a lot of um, work around um, <coughs> education in health and um, the HIF Impact Project Foundation shows that education, education can actually help people improve their own health and their life as well. And, um, this is probably the, the health part of that um, evaluation. And it enables to take, um, adults to take part in shared decision making, um, develop informed adult, adults who can help to shape health policy, um, assist in tackling growing health inequalities gap, um, enhance mental health well-being and support the maintenance of good physical health. Um, I've also been involved in um, a project called Skilled Health, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. Um, it was funded by the Department of Health and the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. And it uses health as a topic to hook people into learning and embed skills for life within it. Um, and that was nationally evaluated. Um, and really it was more giving people those health literacy skills that they need to be able to function on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and they, the evaluation that was done by the Tesla interview 
um, Institute um, um, shows that. Um, sorry, can we just go back a bit? Well, sorry, because I'm not terms. So, um, and health literacy is giving people skills and ability to be able to function in everyday situations. And this again is where adult education can play a key role. Um, and the project I worked on, School for Health, um, there's a whole set of resources that use health as a topic and then embed skills for life within it. And they're freely available on our website, so if you wanted to use those. And in fact, giving those people the skills that they need to be able to understand how to um, eat in terms of portion controls, um, the balance of food that you should be eating, how to shop on a budget, it covers loads of things. But 43%, this is a study that was carried out by the Linda Southwark University, and 43% of adults aged 18 to 65 don't routinely understand health information. So we've done quite a lot of work in um, cancer, um, looking at simplifying information for cancer patients. And we've done some work around bowel cancer. And um, I don't really know that when you get to age 60, you get a thing through the post that asks you to do bowel cancer testing. And they were using words like rectum. And when we, when we went around trying to, running focus groups with people, a lot of people didn't even understand what a rectum was. You know, so you know, you've, you've stopped before you've even started. Or um, the lady who had um, couldn't understand why her cancer treatment, why she was feeling worse when she'd had a positive cancer result. So she'd only understood one, um, and she'd only got one understanding of the word positive. Um, so that's, you know, understanding health information is really difficult for people who, if you think about it, are kind of at a you know, the, uh, a reading age of 11 to 14, and there's 11 million people around that age, and most of the information that comes out from health is at level three. So you can understand why um, people can't understand information, or even reading a, a food label, which is, you know, we're talking about 61% of people, um, that rises to 61% of people when there's numeracy involved. Reading a food label is quite a complex mathematical um, thing to do, isn't it? Why don't you, why don't they take the medications properly? Well, if you can't tell the time, taking two tablets three times a day is meaningless because you could take two tablets at nine o'clock, two tablets at quarter past nine, and two tablets at half past nine, and you take your two tablets three times a day. And when you th if you think that um, people have, you can see this is my area of passion, um, when you think that people live longer with more, di more chronic illnesses, and, and quite, quite often have to take quite a lot of tablets. You can see where, why then um, it becomes difficult to, to take those tablets and then they don't get better and they're represented the hospitals and the doctors. And then us, and quite a lot more money. I think Penny's going to talk about this in a little bit more detail about the cost to the public health of doing these things. Um, so the Skill for Health evaluation shows that. Um, People engaged in the project, um, and this was delivered in lots of different settings, with, in prisons, in communities, in libraries, in the workplace. Um, so resources were used in lots of different settings, and um, it increased people's knowledge about um, health eating and taking exercise. But it also changed those behaviours, those health behaviours. But not just the health behaviours, it changed the learning behaviours because many more of them went on to take on. It's getting them in and, and uh, you know, teaching my grandmother to suck eggs here. But it, once you've got them into the education, uh, they quite often carry on on that journey, don't they? And health is the thing that hooks them into that. It also showed that um, the learners cascaded that knowledge to their own family and out into the wider community. So that knowledge was passed on. And we did, we did actually work with a group of carers and the guy that managed them um, 
said that not only had it helped the carers and their families, but it also helped the people that they were caring for, because that knowledge was being passed on to them and we were better able to take care of them. Um, as I say, health helps people to learn a bit more than only engaging to the back of the back, just instead of a market screen at the end of um, The public health priorities, um, I'm going the first three are probably the ones that would be the ones that you would engage in. Um, the first one is to help people live longer and more um, healthy lifestyles by reducing those preventable, preventable deaths. Um, mm -hmm. So associated with smoking and high blood pressure and drinking too much, all the things that we know about. Um, and supporting families to give children and young people the best start. And it's those, it's those early years where health behaviours are set. So if you can um, talk to people to get parents involved in, in health and health literacy and into education, um, they can actually um, impact on their children at an early age. And we actually do some work around with um, denial in Wiltshire around early years centres working in children's centres um, delivering programmes to people with children of one to three years of age and it has had a massive impact on the way that their children eat and um, lead their, their lifestyles. Um, and improving health in the workplace. Um, and again, Penny's going to touch on this a little bit more later on, but I want, to, this is, as I said, this is a two way stream and there's an opportunity here for public health practitioners to educate um, family learning or, or um, adult learning practitioners in public health and understanding the public health agenda. Um, the more enlightened of them realise that people from um, adult education, both in the, the statutory and in, in other sectors, are the, uh, a wide, part of the wider public health um, Workforce, so they do understand that already, and there's an opportunity there for, for and you can help them to do that by um, guiding them on how to do things like learning outcomes and stuff like that, and they can help you to understand public health outcomes. So you can see the benefits of this courses, working in partnership to deliver courses to people in the community because part of your priority is to widen and deepen those sorts of learning experiences for <coughs> people um, and maximise those benefits that impact on that, um, those people who have um, the lowest um, levels of social and economic um, income and lifestyles and improving their well-being. So we know that these, these big opportunities for us and um, it's really important to think now that they've moved into those into into um, local authorities that you try and contact them. And I know it's not going to be easy. I mean, I've tried to look myself on the website to find out who the health and it's the health improvement leads that you need to contact. They're the people that you need to be speaking to. Would you say that again? Health, the health improvement leads. Now they may not be called, always be called to that, but if you say health improvement leads, everybody will know who you're talking and what you're talking about. And they're, they're the people that you need to speak to. They're the people who deal with all those things that I've just been talking about. The social and economic determinants of health, the obesity, drinking, all those sorts of things, their education. Um, and they're the people that you need to contact. Um, and I'm just going to give some steps that might um, help you out. So find out who your health improvement need is. Um, if you want to understand what the priorities are in your local area, you need to look at the JSNAs, uh, you know, the Joint Strategic Needs. Um, and then there's also some health stats on your local health observatory. So if you Google your local health observatory, and you need to start talking in terms of health outcomes as well as learning outcomes. So you need to, you need to be talking about um, by educating people that you're going to reduce obesity because they're going to know understand how to eat property. All those sorts of things and talk in terms of um, public health to speak if you like. Um, look at what you're already doing because there's a lot of really good, I mean I think there's some examples of it today, but there's lots of really good work going around already and I think you need to look at what you're already doing. Um, and as I say, express that in terms of health outcomes more. Um, <laughs> Understand how your health commissioning, public health commissioning works in your area. And again, it's not easy, and I think um, Penny's going to touch on this as well with the um, health and wellbeing boards. 
Um, but there are tenders coming out, I've noticed, from public health to do some of the work, and they're starting to sort of come out on the um, tender website, so it might stop, you might want to start looking. But you're actually in the same building quite often as most of them, so just go and find out they are, who they are, start talking informally to them. I know, this is what we do, what do you do? This is, you know, look at the wonderful work we're doing. Once you start those uh, conversations going, you can start to set up a, sort of, uh, a series of a formal, or a formal meetings to put exploring joint working in partnership, um, develop that joint health and learning strategy and delivery plan, um, so develop a joint evaluation framework um, that looks at health, captures those health outcomes and those learning outcomes together, and um, undertake a joint pilot and you could even consider some condiments because quite often, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really useful for you to come and live in each other's lives for a little while because then you get a better understanding of how it all works and where you can fit together. And um, learn to speak public health. Everybody's got jargons, everybody's got a way of um, their own language and I think you need to understand their language and speak to them in terms of their language. Um, I, you know, again, Skilled for Health was um, funded by the Department of Health and what's now Beers. And um, it was quite, I wouldn't say it was amusing, but it could be quite challenging sometimes getting everybody to sort of understand where the important things, the things that were important to them. Um, and it took quite a while to overcome some of those barriers between health and education. Um, and I hope. That sort of gives you some insight into it. Um, so my passion is health literacy. And I've seen the impact it has on people, and I've seen the benefits it can bring to people. And I've seen the benefits that education can bring. And that, um, once you start on that journey, the transformational process it can have on people's lives um, and improve their health and well-being. And I think there's enough evidence out there now for education to be able to state its case quite well in terms of health. Thank you. Thank you, Jones. Uh, it's been a really sign as to uh, how helpful a speaker has been. The number of people who got heads down, pens off. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I think um, what, what you, you've given us with that presentation is the, the sort of, what you say, the language that we need to use, the evidence in order that we can have those sorts of dis uh, conversations, discussions at a, at a local level. Um, immensely helpful. Uh, thank, thank you for that. I'm sure there may be some follow-up questions back in the morning. Uh, our last speaker before we have our, our uh, coffee break is Matthew Hill from the, the South West Forum. Um, he's going to be talking about a project called Proving Our Value. That's good, that's a good start. <laughs> okay, I, I'll quit whilst I'm on the head and hand over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Um, okay, um, so it's, it's great to be here this morning um, at what I'm sure is going to be a, a really interesting conference um, throughout today. Um, so I'm an impact and research officer from the Southwest Forum. Um, currently supporting the development of the Impact Hub South West, um, which is a relatively new initiative of the South West Forum, um, and we provide a strand of services to support voluntary community sector organisations um, across the South West to demonstrate the impact of the services that they provide. Um, the different, the uh, broad difference they create across their stakeholders. So, just to say one or two things um, about the South West Forum. Um, we're a regional infrastructure organisation which plays a role in providing a voice for the voluntary and community sector and uh, influencing policy and decision making um, at the strategic level. So we're a membership organisation um, supporting organisations across the South West um, and we reach out um, across our wider networks to around 16,000 voluntary community organisations um, across the region. So I'm here today to reflect on some of the learning that's um, been arising from improving our value research project that we've been involved in uh, coordinating for the past four years. 
and one of the case studies involved within this project uh, has captured evidence on the broader impact of adult learning um, and education courses provided by the Washington community organisations. So the impact has been captured in both an economic sense, but it also reflects significant changes in the level of individual health and well-being. And I'll address some of these key findings with you here today. So um, just before I reflect on these findings, I thought I'd briefly kind of explain uh, the role of the Impact Hub Southwest and the services we provide. Um, so our core aim, uh, as I mentioned, is to demonstrate how voluntary community sector organisations um, make a difference and communicate this more broadly. Um, and we facilitate this um, through drawing on the existing skills and expertise um, across the Southwest region through a network um, of different associates. And these associates may involve um, research academics, uh, research consultants, and uh, other voluntary, sets, voluntary community sector organisations that have experience in demonstrating their impact. Um, we provide the support through a series of training courses which, and workshops which we run throughout the region, focusing on different areas of uh, impact practice. Um, and we also provide an advice and consultancy service to organisations, um, some of which we provide in-house. And we also work as a broker uh, between organisations and our associates um, to provide particular support around different areas of impact practice. So the Impact Hub um, has really arisen out of the, the networks and relationships um, that have developed through the Proving Our Value Research Project. Um, so this has been a four-year, um, big lottery-funded project taking place across the Southwest region. Uh, and the kind of overarching focus for the research has been on demonstrating the economic impact of the social actions of social purpose organisations. Now, the initial, initially the project had more of an economic focus, but as the research has evolved, um, we've recognised the importance of not only capturing the, the economic impact, but also the broader, the broader sorry, social impacts arising from particular interventions. So, um, sorry, we yeah, move to the slides. So, the project itself um, has involved four, five um, case studies which have each run for two years, and each of the case studies has been a, res a research partnership between a university and one or a number of social purpose organisations. Um, and each case study has focused on a different strand of social purpose activity. So, for example, uh, we have a case study that's focused on the impact of social prescribing services through healthy living centres, the impact of infrastructure services, the long-term value of advice through the Citizens Advice Bureau, um, the impact of community development projects, and also the impact of skills and learning projects that have been delivered. So, so just to briefly touch on the kind of core aims uh, of proving our value, uh, which has been to provide robust evidence for voluntary community sector impact, provide new approaches and measures to collating data and evidencing impact, to develop effective partnerships between higher education institutions and social purpose organisations and to influence policy and practice. So we're now in year four <coughs> of research and the five case studies have now come to an end and the findings have all been written up as separate reports. So we're looking to, to release each of these reports over the following few weeks, uh, disseminating this through our regional and national networks and also the networks of our associates. So today, um, I was going to reflect on the findings from one of our case studies, um, which was developed to measure the impact of the provision of adult education and training courses run by social purpose organisations in Oakhampton. Now, um, for those of you who aren't aware of Oakhampton, uh, it's a market town in rural Devon. And in this particular town, uh, there have been over 300 redundancies, um, which have been caused by the closure of four food processing factories in a single year, um, which had an extremely significant effect within the town, which had a population of only just under 8,000. So the research was undertaken by a partnership between the University of Exeter and the Community Council of Devon. And um, I'll just very briefly run through the kind of core objectives of the project. Um, firstly, they were to identify social purpose organisations 
delivering support services designed to improve the skills and employment prospects of individuals within the Oak County area. Um, secondly, the project aimed to identify and quantify the impact of such interventions on individuals that benefit from skills, enhancement activities and training. And finally, the project looked to identify and quantify the economic and the wider socio-economic impact at the community level. So interestingly, the researchers wanted to establish both the economic as well as the social impacts um, that are emerging as a result of individuals taking part in the uh, learning and education courses. So, the research approach itself, um, firstly, a return on investment in skills methodology was undertaken. Um, which I'll just very briefly mention because this was taken to capture the, the economic impact that was emerging through the, through the um, uh, learning education courses. So it calculated a percentage return on the economic gains that might accrue as a result of an individual um, taking part in these courses. So for example, um, this took account of improvements in levels of income. For, um, for an individual who may have progressed into employment uh, as a result of taking part in a particular course, and this was compared uh, with the costs incurred to the individual um, from travelling to the training um, and, for example, uh, the costs of childcare that, that they may have had to, uh, to have paid for. So to catch the broader social outcomes for the individuals, um, there was a, an index of social benefits was developed, uh, which I'm going to go on to talk about in the following slides. And the project focused specifically on the services of uh, three different social purpose organisations. Firstly, Rochdale Connections Trust, um, which aims to connect young people with adults and help them return to education and training. So they provide training courses with management, personal development, mentoring and community work. Secondly, the Westwood Pathfinder, um, which delivers training specifically focused on IT support. And thirdly, Business Information Point, and their aim was to help individuals with new businesses we have new business startups, sorry, um, supporting the development and sustainability of new enterprises. So, the training for each of these organisations was provided um, typically on a weekly basis, um, with many courses uh, taking a modular fashion. And the training, the, the research project itself, um, involved 64 different trainees in total, um, and around 50 of these. Uh, were interviewed on two separate occasions and this enabled the researchers to track the changes taking place in their lives over a nine month period in both an economic and a social sense. So an index of social benefits was developed for the research and this integrated elements from both the New Economics Foundation Wellbeing Index and a wellbeing scale known as the Soul Record Tool. In total, 36 questions were developed to explore five different dimensions of well-being. And these included the dimensions of general well-being, um, so this was in relation to general life satisfaction um, and any issues surrounding levels of anxiety or depression. Individual attitude, um, so relating to uh, the feelings of the trainees towards themselves and the levels of optimism that they had for the future. Social networks and relationships, um, so, relating to, so relating to the networks and relationships with uh, family, friends and neighbours. Levels of trust and belonging in reference to relationships within the broader community. Levels of pride and, uh, and also ownership from the surrounding neighbourhood within which they lived. And well-being and work. And this reflected on levels of self-esteem and confidence um, as a result of moving into employment, but also as a result of taking steps to progress towards employment. So the questions are asked in two separate waves. The trainees work through the questions during the interviews uh, in the outset of then taking part in the training. And this provided baseline information across these different dimensions of well-being. A second wave of questions was administered to the individuals nine months later, and each question included a six-point scale. So the second wave of questions could then track the progress that the individuals had made in reference to these different domains of outcomes. If changes um, were then, if, if we could then recognise changes um, in the individuals in the, in the way in which they've marked themselves on these different scales, 
questions were then asked as to whether these changes were brought about because of the specific training event, whether it was because of other training uh, that the individual had taken part in, whether this was actually unconnected to any training um, was due to other changes taking, part, um, taking place in the life of an individual. So after accounting for these broader questions, um, changes across these different domains of social benefits um, could then be calculated. So, um, this slide focuses on the changes taking place in the life of a particular individual as a result of the training they were involved in. Um, now, the font itself is very small on this particular slide, uh, but I'm just going to very briefly talk through the main points um, and the findings that the, the research has been able to deduce. So for this individual, there were clear financial benefits um, as they moved into employment um, from a position of unemployment um, as a result of taking part in the training and therefore, um, and therefore their, their income levels um, increased significantly. Um, but in addition to the financial benefit, um, levels of well-being also improved significantly as a result of the training. Um, and this is particular, for this individual, this is particular um, in relation to their attitude, to the way in which they felt about themselves. Um, and also their, their self-esteem um, as a result of being supported to make strides towards employment. So the well-being, um, the well-being work dimension also increased for this individual significantly. And at the bottom of the slide, um, there's a graphical uh, representation um, of the increase in each of these dimensions. So you can, so you can slightly see that there's a, a shape more towards the centre of the graph, which shows the, uh, the baseline for that individual when they first start to take part in the training. Um, and following the second wave of interviews, you, you can, there are particular, the particular dimensions of attitude and well-being and work have increased, um, which, which can be seen from that particular, from, from that particular radar graph. So, across the individuals, there were also a number of kind of, of wider um, social and personal benefits that resulted um, through them taking part in the training. Um, and these wider benefits included making friends, improving confidence, and also their networking, which can be reflected by the following quotes. Um, so, for example, uh, the train, one of the, uh, the unemployed trainees remarked that the trainers were the first people to reflect positively on my business idea and give me the confidence to take it forward. Really helpful on the confidence side, especially in setting up a new, new business with no idea. And I've got some new, new qualifications, made some friends, and hopefully we'll get a job soon. Now the diagram in this particular slide um, displays the broader social benefits which could be attributed to the individuals taking part across in the training across the three separate organisations. So it, aggregate, it illustrates the overall aggregated change um, across all of the beneficiaries. Um, it's slightly different from the previous graph because this shows the percentage increase across all of these different dimensions um, of, of well-being uh, which have been aggregated. So we can see that across the majority of the dimensions, particular, particularly attitude, general well-being, well-being um, with work, uh, progressing towards training, um, and trust and belonging have, have increased significantly. And we have a further graph here, um, which is slightly different again, because this diagram illustrates changes in social benefits by employment status. So the research here uh, shows that over, that over the different types of employment status um, have been associated with different well-being impacts that have resulted from the training. So, for example, unemployed trainees, um, or those trainees that were unemployed at the time they took part in the training, um, improved, improved their scores uh, in overall general well-being. And that those that were pursuing a self-employed route um, through the training um, were seen to improve significantly in the attitude measure uh, in terms of the feelings about themselves um, and feelings of, of greater optimism towards the future, following support from the training uh, to, to take strides uh, towards taking their particular business idea forward. So, just to briefly focus <coughs> on some of the key findings that have emerged from the, uh, the research. Um, 
and just going to touch on, a, on one or two of these. Um, but it's evident that findings, fi these findings do indicate significant economic and social benefits for these individuals following the training, impacting not only on, on families, um, individuals in the financial sense, but also showing that taking part on, within the training has had a significant impact on levels of individual well-being. And the key point I wanted to really focus on is this value of happiness. And this emerged as a, as a core theme for this particular project. And in fact, this emerged across the five Kruger value case studies um, as key. And there was an em emphasis on service users um, across the different interventions and the impact that services have had um, on their life and their general well-being. Um, and in fact, this, is, this may be very closely intertwined and interrelated to so many other changes taking place in the life of an individual, whether this be learning new skills, meeting new people, establishing new networks, um, or change in their employment status. And improvement in overall well-being was, was also seen as so important in helping individuals overcome uh, other barriers that they may face in their lives and taking on um, other challenges in the future through um, improvements in their, in, their, in their attitude and levels of self-motivation and, and self-determination. And in the middle of April, South Forma are, are, are hosting a regional conference in Bristol, uh, we've been, which we've entitled In Pursuit of Happiness. And this is to reflect on the findings across all five of our case study projects and, uh, and emphasising really the important changes and outcomes that have been brought about for those individuals involved. So, so that really draws um, draws together the presentation really and focusing on some of those findings that we mentioned in the presentation. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Um, right, we now have a, a coffee break. Um, coffee's just across uh, from this building. Um, just before you go through the archway, on the right there's a door in there and that's where all the uh, coffee will be laid out. If you can come back uh, for 20 past, then we will kick off with our final presentation. Thank you very much.